Startup Interluin signed a contract with the U.S. Department of Energy for plans to mine helium-3 on the surface of the moon, all before the company has executed, executed its first journey into space, which it aims to complete by the end of this year. It's part of a side of the space economy that my next guest says is growing in recent years. And here with more on some of the emerging ways to play the emerging side of the space race is Chad Anderson. He is a space capital founder and CEO and author of The Space Economy. Chad, great to have you here. We're going to get to mining helium-3 on the moon in a second, but first I want to ask you about Elon Musk. We had some really big news last week about a pay package at Tesla. Anytime that's kind of front and center, it suggests that he's going to be spending a lot more time over at Tesla, maybe to the detriment of SpaceX. How big is SpaceX in the industry, and how does it kind of affect your role as a VC allocator of funds? So, I mean, in the space economy, SpaceX is the apex player. Um, the U.S. Uh, space program has become completely dependent on the company over the past 10 years. And the reason for that is because the company does things better, faster, cheaper than anyone else, right? I mean, there was a lot of incumbents before SpaceX that had gotten sort of fat and happy. Um, and SpaceX came in and, and shook things up and did things in a different way. So they have certainly earned their place at the top of the food chain in the space economy. Um, and, you know, I mean, Elon Musk has been um, involved in many companies since the beginning, um, and I don't think that that's going to change. Yes. Um, and now I want to ask you about Helium-3. Kind of blows my mind that we're talking about allocating resources to mine stuff on the moon, no matter what it is. I mean, it could be helium, it could be anything. How realistic is this? Is there a time frame, realistically, that we can wrap our heads around this? Yeah, so Helium-3 has been the holy grail of lunar resources for decades. Um, and it's really been hyped that way. Um, and I think the idea is that the moon will be sort of Saudi Arabia for the 21st century, where it's you know exporting um, clean fusion fuel to power the world. And that's what it is. It's fuel because you can then use that to parlay uh, in you know a journey to Mars or other things. Like, how, where does that take us? Well, the idea, I think, I mean, the, the numbers that they're talking about in terms of market, I think what they're talking about doing is extracting it and using it on the moon, but also bringing it back to Earth. So, I mean, uh, the, the challenge is that there's a long way between here and there, right? There's no fusion reactors. Um, the, this is a potential fuel. There's no fusion reactors that are using uh, fuel today. So this is kind of, um, this is really interesting because it's sort of, we're seeing private capital test the boundaries of the space economy and what's possible. Um, but at the same time, it is sort of a moonshot um, on top of a moonshot. No shot. pun intended, yeah. yeah. Um, testing the boundaries, yeah. I, we've seen that play out in the investment market before, kind of a function of liquidity. I want to ask you about the Trump administration, who has arguably, arguably been vocally supportive of uh, U.S. space endeavors. And he says he's moving the U.S. Space Command headquarters from Colorado Springs to Huntsville. What does that, what are the ramifications of that? Does it change some of the players? Does it mean some people will get favored status over others? Any changes there? Well, no real changes in the immediate term. It's going to take some time for that to play out, right? So um, the uh, Biden administration moved it to Colorado based on readiness is because they had the facilities there already built out. So they can move it to Alabama, and, um, uh, but it's going to take some time to build out those facilities and get it ready. So in the next few years, there's not going to be any practical um, impact, although there's going to be probably more flights um, uh, by incumbent space companies going to both locations. All right. A lot of the discussion so far has admittedly been theoretical, and we're talking about the far future sometimes. What can investors invest in right now in terms of space? Yeah, so like um, lunar resources, for example, is one piece of what we call emerging industries. That's really like 3% of what's going on here. Um, and it includes other things like uh, commercial space stations, like uh, logistics is another area in the, emerging er in the emerging industries that's really interesting, which is space situational awareness, space traffic management. How, we're launching so many more thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of satellites. How are we making sure that they all um, have safe orbits to operate in and they're not running into each other, right? And also um, companies like Impulse Space that are um, doing propulsion, which is allowing the Trump administration to do more um, space force activities like rendezvous proximity ops, basically being able to have your satellite go, change its orbital inclination, change its altitude, move around and do different dynamic maneuvers as we build up the Space Force and as we think about um, space as a contested domain. I want to ask you about some of the larger players that we think of in aerospace and defense, like maybe Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon. 
How are these players positioned well in the, in the space race? Yeah, so I mean, um, everything that's going on today from an, uh, a private capital, private markets perspective is really underpinned by SpaceX and their ability a little over a decade ago to bring prices down, um, bring costs down, bring transparency uh, to pricing and to the market for the first time. So the incumbents were, um, like I said, um, they'd gotten a little comfortable. A little, um, little too fat and happy. And um, SpaceX shook things up a bit, right? So they are um, uh, working to get back into this. There's a lot of opportunities for these incumbents are looking for, they've all set up um, uh, corporate uh, venture capital funds to invest in early stage companies to get more involved in them. They're, we're seeing more teaming agreements and partnership agreements to go after big government contracts. Um, but look, the Golden Dome Initiative is a massive $175 billion sure. uh, White House initiative um, for defense, and space companies are gonna play a key role in that. From startup companies to the big incumbents, everyone's going after that pot of money. All right, you got your work cut out for you, I know. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Chad.